Don't mind me. Have you found him? Forgive me, your majesty. We have not been able to track down the crown prince yet, but we are doing our best. Then what are you still standing here for? Go and look for him. Uh, yes, of course, your highness. Ilias watched as the guard hastily stumbled out of the wide auditorium past the crowd of men and women entering the hall. These people were all from influential families with long-lasting reputations to their names and wanted to watch the speech in person. He was standing on the sidelines of the stage with Sarai and Tamara, separated from the audience by the thin partition so that they could be seen directly. He looked down after he felt a tug on the sleeve of his uniform. Tamara had reached for him. But she didn't look at him directly as her gaze was lowered. The sadness and shame on her face was plain to see. Just seeing his little girl like that was enough to tear at his already poor heart. Such a tiny girl, and yet she had to carry us so much responsibility on her little shoulders. His already poor heart. Did she get the constitution of her mother and the temperament of her father? And Ira got the temperament of her mother and the constitution of his father. Elias knelt down by his daughter and gently lifted her head to look her straight in the eyes. With misty eyes, she tried to avoid him, but he gave her no chance. Mishaps happen, sweetheart. And that's completely fine. Don't cuddle her, Elias. She had one job and she couldn't even do it properly. It was her responsibility to look after the Crown Prince, and now he's nowhere to be found. Sarai? Before Elias was able to refute his wife, he felt his daughter's hand reach for his own as though she didn't want him to stand up for her. I apologize, Mother. Yes, you are right. This is my fault. I am to blame. Good. Sarai, that's enough. The responsibility doesn't lie on Tamara. It lies on us. On you and me both as parents. If you want to blame someone for Ira constantly running away, you should start with yourself. A good dad. It pained his heart to have to say these words, but he had it had enough. He could no longer bear to watch Sarai take out her own frustration and insecurities on their daughter time and time again. Sarai's eyes widened. Of all people, she probably hadn't expected that Ilias, someone who had always stood by her side since their childhood days, who had always offered her his shoulder to lean on at the worst times of her life, would now turn against her. I see. Taking a step back, she turned away from him and looked into the distance, rubbing her arm. Oh, my love. When will you ever be able to let others into your heart? Now the murmur of the audience had grown louder. The room had filled up and everyone had found their respective seats. It was about time. Now that I think about it, where exactly is Rufus? Wasn't he supposed to give a short speech after yours? Hmm. Indeed. I was wondering the same. At that moment, as if they had called for it, the door behind them burst open and a man out of breath stepped toward them. <sighs> Forgive me for my unsightly manners. I arrived as soon as I could, as I will be representing my brother in his stead. Due to his current health condition, he will not be with us today. I understand. There's probably nothing that can be done about it. He already looked very sickly when he was welcoming us yesterday. Hmm. We just knew him, though even in passing, they hadn't exchanged, exchanged a word. It was the man who had welcomed him together with Rufus the day prior. Darius, the bastard prince. At least that's what they called him at court. It was said that the previous leader of this arc had fallen hopelessly in love with a prostitute from the slums and made her his concubine. And thus the man who now stood before them, trying to compose himself, had been conceived. At least recalled that the prince's concubine mother had unexpectedly passed away during his childhood due to an, air quotes, illness. Could have been straight up illness and that radicalized Darius, but over a few years after her passing, rumors of poisoning began to call, being the cause of her deaths began to spread. Okay, okay, yep. Air quotes, illness. After all, it was no secret that the leader's wife, Rufus's mother, had harbored a grudge against that woman. What a pitiful man. Must have had a traumatic childhood, no matter, no doubt. Childhood, if you can even call something like that childhood. What a... 
I can. Hmm. <laughs> I feel like that li that that one sentence is also very telling for Ilias's character, a royal who stands with that royal privilege, to sort of instinctively and innately look down on people, yet still has a good heart. When he thinks, what a pitiful man, I'm sure he's thinking, this man is deserving for this man is deserving of pity. But when you read when you read the sentence, what a pitiful man, you think. This man is sad <laughs> and pathetic. <laughs> it's a line that offers pity for Darius's situation yet has that innate royal condescension in it. Darius's eyes wandered to the watch on his wrist and then back to the royal family with a nod he pointed to the center of the stage. It's time. The broadcast will begin in less than two minutes. Understood. Would the prince consort and the princess like to stand behind her majesty while she is giving her speech? The Ox residents would certainly be delighted to see the entire royal family together like this. Entire. When first Ilias and Sarai exchanged confused looks, this was not part of the program. Originally, he and Tamar were supposed to remain on the sidelines as onlookers. The sigh, Sarai closed her eyes and nodded. Fine. She cast one last glare at him with an expression Ilias knew only too well. The discussion isn't over yet, we'll talk later. He couldn't help but crack a smile. He then turned around and stepped toward her designated position, nor when Sarai came into the spectator's line of sight, the auditorium's murmurs ceased. Come now, sweetheart. Let's follow your mother. He gently took hold of his daughter's hand, and together they followed his rather stubborn wife to the front center of the stage. Standing a little at the side beside her, he tenderly placed his hands on Tamara's shoulders, who he had moved in front of her. Without wasting another second, Sarai began her speech as soon as she had received the cue. What do you think of relationship dynamics like that, where... Looking at it as an outside observer... It looks like... You're in love? And yet, Ilias here is still very clearly in love... With his wife. And behind the scenes, when it's just them... They may be happy, but looking at them from outside, you might be thinking... Red flags for red flags on this lady. It's a complicated relationship, no doubt. It's intriguing to think about. Why am I? F Don't mind me rambling. Sorry. As Elias had expected, her voice resonated with grace and elegance, as though she meant every word she said. Yet he was the one who had actually written it. Ah. She almost seemed as though she wasn't harboring any negative emotions, though she wasn't dying of worry because her precious little boy had vanished without a trace. Ira. It would be lying if he said that he wasn't worried about the whereabouts of his son. After all, like tomorrow, he was his child, the child of the woman he loved, after all. All this was his fault. Ira's impulsivity and the strange relationship between mother and daughter. If Ira hadn't inherited Ilias, 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 Ilias' weak heart, Sarai most likely wouldn't be so overprotective of him, which in turn meant that he wouldn't be so out of control. Now that I think about it, why did he refer to us as the entire royal family despite Ira being missing? Why didn't he even bother to ask about him? He looked at the man standing on the sidelines who simply returned a broad smile, feigning ignorance. Huh? There was something irritating Elias, Elias, however. It was a small beeping sound that rang in his ears and yet was barely perceivable. Where did it come from? Without wanting to attract unnecessary attention during Sarai's speech, he looked around cautiously. An instant he faltered. Where did he go? Darius, the man who had smiled at him just a few seconds earlier, had disappeared. Immediately, Eliza's stomach began to twist, a sweat formed on his palms, and the grip of his daughter's shoulders tightened. Then, as though he already knew, his eyes wandered up to the, ca to the canopy of the stage as an ice-cold shiver caused him to choke. Amidst the pipes, poles, and panels that held the roofing together, Countless small red lights blinked down to him. Hardly noticeable unless one paid closer attention to them. Bombs. Long live the future of humanity. Long live the... One desperate attempt, Eli Elias lunged forward. 
Clutching his daughter tightly onto him with one arm, he pushed Sarai forward on off the stage using all the strength he could muster with the other. He had to protect them, come what may. Even if he had to give his life in return, he had to... His body felt light, almost weightless, by the time he regained consciousness. And he knew for certain that this was not the case. Quite opposite. Along with his daughter, he had been buried under the rubble of what had once been the auditorium. With what little strength he had left, he was able to support himself on his arms and shield her underneath. D Daddy? His daughter's trembling voice seeped hazily through his blood-soaked ears. A wave of relief washed through whatever he could still feel of his body. Putting his mouth, he wanted to say something to her, but instead of words, a warm, thick liquid pushed its way up his trachea causing him to choke on his own words. Ah, so, uh, that's it, huh? His hand went to his heart, where it used to be. Oh, God! His hand went to his heart, where it used to be. For in his place, uh, in place of the fabric of his uniform, he felt the cold steel of a steel pipe stained with his own blood. Yes. <laughs> he'd give to see her again, at least one last time. Her adorable green eyes. Her sweet smile that reminded him of her mother when he was the, she was that age. His little Tamara. Yet he knew he'd be denied this selfish wish because it was far too dark to see anything behind beneath this rubble. He gently reached for her, felt her long black hair, her thin, fragile arm, and stopped at her burning hot cheek and drenched in tears. In hopeless attempt, he carefully tried to wipe away the tears with his thumb. With every tear he tried, two more appeared. You... have to... live. Please! Don't leave me, Daddy! Please! Please! With each passing second, his body became heavier, as if it wanted to melt into the ground. The muscles that mere moments ago were full of adrenaline became weaker, and his eyelids longed to close forever. It was time. Did Sarai make it? Did she manage to avoid the direct impact of the explosion? Was she still alive? Perhaps we could find out on the other side when their souls met again, as she cursed at him. An idea which he gladly welcomed. Shit, here we go. Let us remember those who regrettably did not make it to this glorious day. Those who gave their lives so that we can live a fulfilled life within the arcs in peace and prosperity. Side Zeke? Let us honor those who continue to fight for us every day outside, hoping that one day we will be able to return. Long live the future of humanity! Long live the... Disbelieve what had happened before their eyes, the five of them weren't able to do anything but remain silent. The first person to break the silence was Felix, Lydia's younger brother. An attack? Though Zeke would have liked to refute this, the facts were clear. By now, even the bystanders surrounding them seemed to have realized what had happened just a few seconds ago. But the crowd became noisier, restless like a typhoon, the voices intertwined into a huge roar, uproar of terrified screams. The awful anticipation of a festive day filled with happiness and serenity was painfully ripped away from them. I... Oh, we... we need to calm the civilians! Yes! As Lydia prepared to take her first step toward the mob, a violent earthquake erupted beneath their feet! She stumbled, but fortunately, Zeke swiftly wrapped his arm around her waist, shielding her from the impact. Gratefully, she clung to his shirt and he, as he helped her back to her feet. The blood-curdling rumble of the quake drowned out the stampede of panicked cries from the people transforming into a torrent of terror that surged toward the group, threatening to engulf them. What's going on? I don't know, but whatever it is, it's not. The ground's tremor subsided in a matter of seconds, offering them a false sense of relief, convincing them it was over. Yet Nahum's call was drowned out by an ear-piercing scream that shook Zeke to the core. He recognized this agonizing cry all too well. After all, he had been forced to confront it several times beyond the Ark's protective walls. I'm Miras? Oh! He was not the only one to conclude this, as the whole area soon dissolved into a symphony of fear. 
screaming. People ran in all directions, stumbling over each other. People scattered like sand in the wind, without regard for those around them. Infant men trampling others to ensure their own survival. And the five of them remained rooted to the same spot, horrified as they watched the unfolding scene before them. What are Hymeras doing inside the Arks? How... How is that even possible? Lily was the first to manage to utter a word, with her hand still buried in his, sh in his shirt. So he could feel her trembling, temper tender body against his. Uh, uh, oh, how deeply he felt the need to pull her close to him and quell her fear. Not the time, Big Zeke. No, no such selfish requests had no place in a situation like this. Good man. He took hold of the, of the hand that had been clinging to him like a lifeline in her panic and separated her from him. Serious expression, he took a deep breath to calm his own shaky voice before he began to speak. We have to head to the base and get our mechs. We won't be able to do anything against the Hymerus, and we'll just end up as fodder for them if we stay on the ground like this. Yes, you're right. Agreed. We won't be able to help the civilians like this. Let's... Oh, no. Oh, no? Zeke watched Nahum stagger backwards, his eyes wide with terror. Almost like he had come to a terrible realization. Nahum? Shiloh, she is still... I have to get to her! Oh boy. No! Wait! Despite her pleas, he refused to respond. Nahum simply turned his back on them and ran off in the opposite direction to where their mechs were stationed. That fool! I'll chase after him and bring him back, or he'll end up getting himself killed. You two go on ahead. But... No buts. The protection of the Ark is our top priority. I'm counting on you. Yona! No, don't go. No matter how hard Lydia tried to suppress the fear that was building up inside her, she couldn't fool her body. So fragile and trembling. But who could blame her? Zeke wanted to lay his hand gently on her shoulder to show her that he wasn't alone in this, but... I... No. He froze. The sound of his name plunged a blade deep and agonizingly slow into his soul. No, 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 it was always him. Why? It was so good about him, but someone who didn't give a fuck about her. Hmm. But someone who only had eyes for his sister of all people. We don't have much time. Uh, let's go. That's the correct opinion. I did not expect that so strongly from Zeke. I grabbed Lydia by the hand and her younger brother from, by the wrist, firmly dragging the siblings with him. Why was Zeke so bothered by such trivialities and in a situation like this of all things? Who cared that Lady had unrequited feelings for Nahum was only driving herself to her own misery? <laughs> the kids are not okay. Hey! Zeke! That's not the right way! It is. We are taking a detour through the alleyways to avoid running straight into the Hymerus arms! Uh, uh, my legs hurt! You have to endure it! Run, boy! With every, with every turn they had made, the cries and mirrors became quieter and quieter, fading into the background of the evacuation sirens which were audible throughout the entire arc. Just a little further and they would be there. Just around this corner and then... Zeke, no! Happened in the blink of an eye. Her eyes wide open, looking straight at him. His emerald eyes had usually shimmered at him, brimming with happiness. Her warm, dainty hands had pushed him away with all their might. Those beautiful hands that he had yearned to be touched by all those years. And... The oh! The Hymera behind her, its colossal stature, it had utilized the density of the large buildings that had taken cover in one of the back alleys, waiting for an opportunity to strike. Hid behind a mask of bones, its crimson red eyes were fixated on them, fixated on her. Oh! Oh! God! <laughs> Warm liquid gushed into his face, slowly running down his forehead, across his cheek and onto his chin. Blood. It was her blood that poured down onto him like a rain in the summer evening, wetting his hair, his shoulders, his entire body, enveloped him, even warmed them in a cruel, morbid way. Zeke looked up at the beast at Lydia, the lower half of her body hanging motionless from the mouth of its central head. A single muscle was moving. She was... The monster was mocking him, taking pleasure in the suffering he was subjected to. It sank its teeth deeper into his flesh, like she was a mere toy to play with. Her bones cracked, setting another wave of her blood down on them. <laughs> Lydia, no! no! 
though the poor boy next to him had only just realized what had happened to his lovely sister, in front of his own eyes, he lunged forward. Mustering whatever strength his trembling body had to offer, Zeke managed to grab the boy by the collar and pull him back into a tight embrace. No, let go of me! I have to... I have to go! I have to go to her! Do you have a death wish? You can't help her anymore! She's... she's dead! She's dead and it's all my fault. Shut <laughs> to get out of here while the Chimera was still occupied with her, the potty. So as quickly as, she, as he could, Zeke holstered Felix over his shoulder and began to run. Boy had to survive and he had to make sure of that. If it cost Zeke his own life, that was his debt to her. His debt to her life and the love he destroyed. No! Lydia! Lydia! Well, goddamn. I was just saying 10 seconds ago how I wished that... Whoop! Three years ago? Oh, man. I'm so tired. I can understand why Zeke is yawning like that. But what reason do you have to be tired, Lydia? You even overslept today. Yes, and? Am I not allowed to be tired? Besides, I don't really like having to patrol the labor platform. Whose fault is it that we're forced to do this? Weren't you the one who had the- Ugh. Whose fault is it that we're forced to do this? Weren't you the one who had to pick a fight with the teacher? Ugh. It's his own fault. Well, he wasn't wrong when he said that the slum's residents aren't as entitled to exist as those living on the uh, plateau. Uh, uh? Zeke! You of all people shouldn't say things like that! Aren't as entitled to exist. What? Because I'm from the slums? Is that what you mean? I am saying this because I am from the slums. Someone like you who has led a privileged life on the plateau better keep their mouth shut. Stop arguing, you two. What are you, 12? It's unbearable. What's done is done. Oh, hello. Uh... Hmm. Oh boy. Yeah, oh boy. Despite being in the same unit for almost a year now and attending the military academy together, there were still many fights and a lot of arguing, especially between Lydia and Zeke. They were simply too incompatible in their views to concede to each other. Could their future as a unit really go well under these circumstances? The last thing Shiloh needed were people around her who would take everyone to an early grave because of their ignorance. Hey, everything okay? Are you exhausted? Uh, should we take a break? Mm? No, I'm... <gasps> oh! In an ironic twist of fate, the ground beneath her feet began to rumble, causing her heart to freeze. During a moment of negligence, she had stepped right on a rotten floorboard, which immediately gave way under her weight. In her state of panic, she desperately tried to grab onto her brother, who, realizing her situation, also reached out for her. Wait for their fingers to miss each other by just a few centimeters. Dragged by the darkness, Shiloh plunged into its endless depths. Shiloh! <laughs> oh? Oh! We're back to here. Enveloped in icy coldness. Floating through endless darkness, Shiloh could hear desperate cries in the far distance. Yes, they were not dist yet they were not distressing, oh blood curdling. They sounded almost like a symphony, a melody that spoke of great suffering, carrying one along like a gentle current. The more she let go and allowed herself to wander, the closer she got to them, the lovelier and more vibrant these wonderful voices became. Oh, how very pleasant their voices were to her ears. For so many years she had yearned to finally hear these agonizing cries of mankind, and now they were so close at hand. Hold up. She wanted more. More. She wanted... to watch this forsaken world burn down to the ground and mankind with it. It's almost time. 
In a matter of minutes, the speech of Her Royal Majesty will begin. By now, the entire plaza has become packed with people who are eagerly waiting to finally listen to this once-in-a-lifetime event. While Shadow had hoped that the rebels would take the right track as instructed and ignore her disappearance altogether, she didn't mind that one of the trio had followed her. That is, as long as they didn't get in her way. On the very moment she had picked up the three rebels on Darius's behalf, she knew that Mari, their leader in particular, was skeptical of her as though she had seen right beneath her hard-earned facade. Finally, Shiloh's ultimate destiny was within reach and she wasn't going to let some straight thugs ruin it. If push came to shove, she would... Oh, it looks like it's starting now. This is interesting. Accelerating the speed of her mech, she rushed down the tunnel toward her destination. There wasn't much time left for the show would reach its climax. Yes, yeah, she would succeed, whatever the cost. Two mechs positioned in the distance gradually came into view. They grew larger and larger with every step. It was almost time. We were able to contain her anticipation and eagerness. A layer of sweat formed on Shadow's palms as her body shifted in her seat. Who are you? Identify your... Oh. It's you. What? The shots and screams of the soldiers merged with the sound of an explosion emanating from the radio. It was followed by the static sound of a cut connection. Her gaze wandered to the men in the mechs. At least what was left of them. But all that remained of them were clumps of unidentifiable meat and pools of blood. It was almost ludicrous how easily. The mere sight of Shiloh, who was widely regarded as virtuous, these shoulders the soldiers let their guard down. Who knew that this gentle, lovely woman could help him even a simple fly? What are you? Shiloh's laughter ceased at the rebel's words. Right, that rebel woman was still around. Should she just kill her, too? No, she couldn't afford to lose any more time. Maybe she could kill her as soon as she achieved her goal. Yes, that's right, that's how she would do it. Turban, she shoved the destroyed mechs aside and turned toward the massive gate. Using the front legs of her own mech, she pushed the gates open to reveal a last lopen vault. Ah, she had finally arrived. What... what on earth is that? Do you think the boss will be okay? Oh boy. Of course. She's the boss, after all. You should focus on the mission. The rest of the rebellion is counting on us. Remember at the very beginning when I talked about the uncomfortable power dynamic between Darius and Shiloh? And they had that brief moment where, like, she turned the tables on him and got him in the position of, uh, I'm on top now, big boy. It's that one brief moment. And so, let's say, well, I didn't like the power dynamic between Darius and Shiloh. Wonder if that little tidbit there is indicative of Sh Shiloh's true feelings on the matter. Like, love or not, tool or not, on Darius's part, Shiloh seems genuinely in this. To watch the world burn. And I'm, however much that aligns with Darius or not remains to be seen, but... We have that incident where she... fell and nearly drowned. The call back on. Mentioned first as something that she clearly still has nightmares about, and second, as, uh... Yeah. Very clear sign that she's, uh, shattering quickly. Uh, yes, that's true. It had been quite a while since the two rebels had entered this tunnel, yet there was still no exit in sight. Is this really the way to the slums? As time passed, she began to wonder whether this mission was really the right thing to do. Many people would lose their lives today, by their hands. Oh well, a job's a job. Plus, if this mission came straight from the main faction, so we didn't even have the option to refuse. Her gaze drifted to Aaron's mech in front of her, which was leading her through the dim tunnel. What sort of expression was he wearing right now? What was he thinking about? Memories of last night flashed through her mind as quick as lightning. Memories of his gentle yet firm touch on her exposed body. The way he made her tremble in ecstasy, how he thrust himself deep inside of her, and how he prowled himself in... Alright. I love you. 
I love you, Aron. Uh, Did I really confess my feelings to him? How oh, absolutely dumb of me. How dumb, 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 dumb. You okay, Brett? Yes. Get a grip, Esther. But, but why am I the only one remembering all of this? It just isn't fair. Brett, look. Huh? She looked ahead past his mech and she could see it. A bright light looming in the distance. The exit was finally within reach. He emerged from the darkness of the tunnel and were greeted by the blinding glare of the afternoon sun. Squinting, in her, squinting her eyes, it took Esther a few seconds to adapt to the brightness. Oh. When she fully opened her eyes, she was confronted with a sight so unlike the plateau. Run-down houses were stacked close together, and the street was littered with trash. The street's many narrow side alleys that branched out like veins were filled with filthy, miserable people. Prostitutes eager to find their next client, the street children clawing at each other to maintain a hierarchy between the strong and the weak, haggard corpses on the roadside abandoned to become one with the soil. What a pathetic sight it was. Even inside their air-conditioned necks, the biting stench of decay crawled up their noses. Yes, they had no doubt arrived. In the slums. Huh? Memories of a distant past, a time that she had tried so hard to banish to the back of her mind, fought its way back to the surface. It was a time when she herself was once a child of the slums. Back when she was still an Eve, an orphan with no background or family, slaving away in the red light district day in, day out. Oh. Hoping to get enough food from her labor. Hoping that she could live to see another day. The smell of death clinging to the poor girl. Oh. What a miserable fate she was made to suffer. E9. Would you be so kind as to come over here? E9, oh god. Y yes, madam? That is a concerningly young silhouette. The tiny, meager Esther stumbled into the huge reception hall of Circuit Breakers, the slum's famous brothel, dressed in simple, tattered fabric at barely eight years old. <laughs> However, before she made it to the lavishly dressed woman in the center of the hall, someone behind her suddenly grabbed Esther by the arms and lifted her far too light body into the air, causing her to lose contact with the ground. Those uniformed soldiers who had gruffly seized her, and despite being so young, she knew what that meant. We oui. No! Oh, let me go! Wait! Mada! Help me! Mada! Please help me! No! No! Let me go! No! You're just not profitable for me. You're not even pretty enough that I could sell you to some despicable pervert. Ugh. No matter how hard little Esther tried to wriggle free, she was only a child. Fed up with this despite desperate display, the grips around her arms tightened, threatening to break them in two. <laughs> I'll be better. I, I promise. Please, don't, don't throw me away. And Eve's promise means nothing to me. Your purpose in life is to bring in money and work. Yet you couldn't do even that. But don't worry. The military pays handsomely if you are part of the cleansing. Consider this payment for wasting my time. Oof. How unsightly. Take her away. No! No, no! No, no, no! 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 That day, little Esther, along with numerous others, discarded slum residents. Should have been her tragic end. Cast up by the arcs, she should have become a mindless beast, eh? Should have become. That is what a cleansing was the purge of worthless humans, those who have been denied their right to exist due to their own frailty. <sighs> Calm down, Esther. Bad memories. Bad memories. Hey, are you alright? Yeah, sorry. There's nothing to be sorry about. To her surprise, he spoke in an unusually gentle manner. No stupid remarks, no brat, no nothing. It was almost affectionate. Almost like that. Ah, don't think about it. And immediately the heat rushed back to her head. No, 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 Esther, you only just shelved that. Uh... You sure that everything's all right? Mm-hmm. Let's just continue moving, okay? 
not, not. Trying to suppress her rising shame, Esther proceeded to their destination. She had already wasted enough of their time. If her foolishness caused the whole plan to fail. Each step along the slum's main road, they gradually got close to the blinking circle that marked their destination on the mech's display. Till the points indicating their position and their destination merged into one. It's almost time. In a matter of minutes, the speech of Her Royal Majesty will begin. By now, the entire plaza has become packed with people who are eagerly waiting to finally listen to this once-in-a-lifetime event. Good. I think we've arrived just in time. Now let's hop out of the mechs. Roger. What are they cooking? Once she had left the mech and reached the ground, she was overcome by a stifling, suffocating wave of a sickening stench which had previously been bearable with the mech's ventilation system. Was this smell as bad back then, when she was still an Eve? <laughs> Whoa! And... and... where are we supposed to go now? Uh, according to the plan, somewhere around here there should be a middle-aged woman with long, pitch-black hair, pale skin, and a... feminine physique? What? That's it? How should I know? Mori was the one who had more information about that woman's location. Great. Should we check every house one by one? I don't believe that's necessary. Oh? A soft, almost melancholic female voice from behind them interrupted their conversation. Alarm, they turn around to find a middle-aged woman with long, pitch black hair, pale skin, and a feminine physique. Are you... Owen replied with a slight nod and gestured to the door of one of the houses. Everything about her seemed at odds with her environment. She looked graceful, elegant. Esther couldn't help but be mesmerized by the sight of that woman. Please, follow me. Let's get this over with quickly. All right. Shooting each other puzzled looks, the two rebels followed her into the small, shabby home, or rather what appeared to be its entrance area. Welcome to the both the ladies residence. Don't uh, worry, we won't be inconvenienced. The other ladies are all working. Hmm. Without them having to ask, the woman had already started to open up to them. Esther thought she could see a sad gleam in her eyes as she looked up the stairs, deep in thought. Are you sure you want to do this? Oh yes. I had decided to take my life many years ago. But I never could. Something seemed to be keeping me here. And I think it's this moment here. You are aware that you will take countless lives with you, correct? Her enchanting smile seemed to grow sadder with each passing second. It was like she was reminiscing about times of sorrow and grief. So much regret resonated in her voice, and yet she sounded determined. This Ark and all its people are filled with so much ignorance and self-absorption. They don't care if another life is wiped from existence as long as it isn't theirs. Whether it is a child or adult, woman or man, the elderly or the young, something like compassion doesn't exist in this world. If there truly was such a thing, they wouldn't have she paused and shut her eyes as an attempt to collect her thoughts and organize her emotions. Then they wouldn't have ripped my son, my beloved son, away from me. Then those people wouldn't have watched as my little boy was exiled from the Ark and turned into a Hymira before their very eyes. <laughs> but what am I talking about? I don't want to waste your time with something so mundane. Please, let us begin. Esther saw her partner's face contort into a grimace. She knew he wanted to say something in response, but any words would have been pointless now. So it would have been a, would be over in a matter of minutes anyways. As he strode toward the woman, Aaron, Aaron pulled a vial containing a thick pitch black liquid out of his uniform pocket. Even the mere sight of it sent a shiver down Esther's spine. Are we going to turn her into a Himera? The fact that they had to carry something so dangerous around with them. This substance contains venom extracted from the Himera's bodies and was invented by one of our colony members. He's quite the freak, if you ask me. Ah, oh, I see. 
Here. You need to pull the cap off and drink it in one go. It does have a very sweet scent, but I doubt it will taste good. Not that I've tried it. Owen didn't seem to understand his ramblings, but Esther believed she knew what he was trying to do. Distraction. He at least wanted to distract the poor woman from her troubled thoughts for the last few seconds she had left so that she wouldn't plunge to her doom in the miserable heart. Owen now appeared to realize his intentions, and a smile slowly formed on her lips. For the first time, she looked him straight in the eye. Thank you. Goodbye. Her farewell, so full of determination, did not sound final, but like a promise. Like the hope of a, of a reunion. Before Esther was capable of uttering ever so much of a, as a word, the woman had already poured every last drop of the vile's liquid into her mouth. Rat, we have to leave, now! What? The sight before Esther's eyes made her gentle heart stop. The graceful woman sank to the ground with a thump, her limbs bending and stretching in all directions. Directions in which no part of her body should be moving. Esther! Aaron's firm grip on her waist made her heart resume its natural beat, protecting it from the suffocating feeling that was sinking deep inside her. She knew what it would mean to be exposed to the poison of a Himera, or what happened to the body of a human. She'd experienced it firsthand, and she couldn't move a muscle. She was petrified. This wouldn't end well if she didn't move soon. They had to get out of here as fast as possible, but she, before she could act, Aaron reached for Esther and lifted her far too light body, wrapping her tightly in his arms. Red eyes. Hmm. I think I'm starting to piece together what Esther's... Kind of. Not sure... Not quite sure the how yet. She went through this, uh, purge. Which is supposed to turn you into a Mera. They tried. It didn't completely work because she's still maintaining her humanity. Yet she has the red eyes of a Mera. gurgling sounds of the breaking of the woman's bones became increasingly louder. They overlapped and melted into one, a horrifying, harmonious chord. Instinctively, she had wrapped her arms around her partner's neck, fearing that if I drop her at any moment, she would suffer the same fate as the woman before them. Once outside, Esther heard Aaron release a heavy sigh, like she was the support he so desperately needed. He clutched her tighter, hiding in his face, in her shoulder. No matter how hard he tried to suppress it, she was still able to feel the trembling of his body, even his fingertips. He was scared, but who could blame him? While she wished she could brush her fingers through this big idiot's hair and take away his fears, however... Aran, I... Keep it together, we have work to do. A sudden tremor ripped the two for their moment of respite. Alongside a causing... Almost causing Aran to lose his balance and shock, but he managed to catch himself just in time. What? As they looked up, a horrifying sight awaited them, unfolding right before their eyes. Countless slum residents who had previously gone about their daily lives before had all collapsed to the ground like a house of cards shattered by a gust of wind. It was like the woman they let out painful cries, twisting their limbs in all directions and breaking them off one by one, one after the other. How can this be? Uh-oh. Now that's impossible. This could be happening because of us, could it? Esther in his arms, eh? Aran recoiled, his eyes wide open. Tightening his grip on her, Iran's nails dug into her flesh. It was almost as if he was trapped in his own helplessness. No, if he didn't catch himself, it would be the end for them both. Iran, look at me. Her hands kept his cheeks firmly, pulling his head down toward her so that she could look directly into his eyes. We have to get out of here. Now. Yes, yes, right. Carefully, he set her back down on the ground, giving him a push in the direction of his back as she climbed back into her own. Hey, whiz, this is going to shit. Firmly to shit. They had to get here for the... They all turned into Himeras before the two of them were trapped. Bidding a herd would be a piece of cake for both of them. But not if, them, not if instead of a few dozen there were hundreds, if not thousands. Okay, let's hurry to the... Hello. It was as if life was playing a dirty trick on her. As, at that moment, the building next to her, the building in which the woman had consumed the Himera venom, crumpled. In the wreckage, a massive, fanged skull appeared, shaking ruins and timber, ruined timbers and plaster from itself. And it came another skull, another monster, swathed in misty darkness. There was no life in its eyeless sockets, only an awful, sparkling red light. It reared back its heads, bracing its four clawed paws on what was left of that building, and howled with all three mouths at once. It was an agonizing scream that left Esther terrified. 
that it was searching for something, the beast's heads turned in all directions before its piercing red eyes finally locked onto something, onto her. Mister, watch out! What? What on earth is that? Oh, the gate opened. A wave of unbearable, suffocating heat swept over them, becoming noticeable even inside Mari's mech. A pillar. It was revealed before their eyes was a vast, elevated hall. In its center, a giant crystal towered over them, encircled by what appeared to be a lake. The crystal's red glow was ominously reflected on its surface as luminous little spheres, similar to bubbles, or orbited around it. That shape. Are those... The souls? Normally they aren't supposed to be visible to the human eye. They were often mentioned in fairy tales and bedtime stories. Now she was seeing them with her own eyes, right in front of her. Mari had never seen something so breathtaking before. This is the powerhouse, or rather, the heart of this arc. This is the engine that runs this place and allows people to live their daily lives without turning into a Hymera. I also didn't know that such a thing existed down here. Then how come? We're taking the first step down at the center of the hall. Countless warning signals that began to flash across the windshield of her mech. The heat that accumulated in this room was beyond that vehicle's capabilities. If she stayed near the crystal longer than absolutely necessary, it would inevitably destroy this mech sooner or later. How come I know that? The crystal told me. <laughs> oh! What do you mean, the crystal told you? Can't you hear these excruciating screams? <laughs> this immeasurable suffering? Don't you hear this wonderful symphony? Oh, she was doomed the moment she fell through the floor three years ago and into this red... that red lake. She was doomed ever since then. Mari flinched. What was she talking about? And why did she sound so thrilled? The sick euphoria evident in Shiloh's voice made her stomach twist. Trapped in her discomfort, Mari failed to notice Shiloh getting closer and closer to the crystal, until only the encircling lake was separating her from it. Huh? What are you doing? Are you crazy? You said that this is the Ark's heart. If you destroy it, then... Then I'll also destroy the Ark with it. Exactly. Do you know what this even means? Was this Darius' plan all along? <laughs> Finally, the mask, the shroud that Shiloh had maintained for so long, dropped, revealing her true colors. The face of a manic woman, traumatized by the atrocities of the world, and now turned into one herself. What, Darius? <laughs> no! That pathetic bastard is way too soft. He only has the good of mankind in his heart. Yada, yada, yada. This guy really thought the whole time he had me wrapped around his finger. That I loved him and would do anything for him. I've never seen anyone so stupid before. Oh. You make me sick. So what? I'm tired of this. All these ignorant people. They rob. They murder. They don't give a damn about the suffering of others. They spit on us. Betrayed us. They deserve to die, all of them! Wouldn't this place be so much more beautiful? So much more harmonious if it were free from people. Mari's palms began to sweat and her grip on the steering lever, the steering lever tightened. <sighs> Calm down, Mari. Take a deep breath. If you allow yourself to get carried away now, then... No matter what this mad woman was up to, she couldn't let it turn into reality. Stop! her heart pounding, she steered her mech towards Shiloh in a desperate attempt to stop her, but it was too late. A violent shockwave pushed Shiloh away before Mari was able to brace herself for the impact, causing her mech to overturn. Her head was throbbing, and when she regained consciousness, the red light emitted by the crystal had vanished, and with it, these souls were gone. They were all. She had failed to prevent this woman from committing such a horrible act. Now the blood of several innocent people was on her hands. Looked through the broken glass of the windshield, the light that only sparsely illuminated the room. Some managed to make out a shadow looming over, a shadow of a mech. Would you be so kind and die now? Hmm? Die? What do you mean by die? Oh, I didn't understand. Like Shadow was speaking in words in a language completely foreign to her. She only understood just as the long barrel of the shadow cloaked mech was slowly aiming at her. That woman wanted to kill her. She wanted to. During the reality, Mari managed to regain control of her mech in the nick of time, avoiding a hail of bullets raining down around her. 
relentlessly, her opponent continued to fire at her, each shot more accurate and closer to her mech than the last. Shit! If only she were in her own mech, not in this unfamiliar and now completely wrecked metal box. But she had no time to pity herself. She could wallow in it once they had gotten out of here alive. But how is she supposed to find an opening? How would she overpower a vast, a vastly superior opponent? Shiloh! No! At that moment of hopelessness, a young man's shout cut through the battle's relentless clamor, bringing the rain of bullets to an abrupt halt. Oh no, she's gonna go right back onto the mask get Nahum to fight her, too, as though something was preventing her opponent from shooting. This was her chance. Using the situation to her advantage, Mari started firing, destroying the opposing mech's barrel in two out of its six legs, slowing it down momentarily. Now she'll need to get out of here. However... You bastard! Keep your fucking hands off my sister! And then mech blocked her. Only possible escape route. Having located its target, he charged directly towards... She's got backup. What? time, she managed to evade his strikes. His attacks were fiercer, more erratic than his partners, almost clumsy. Like in a dance fueled by anger and desperation, they maneuvered through the hall. What are you doing here? Why aren't you with Yona? Leave! Her destructive madness and sadistic desire to destroy everything in her path evaporated. Instead, Mari heard a quiver of panic in Shadow's voice as if she was a completely different person. Like that man had ebbed the tide of the raging hatred deep inside her. Are you crazy? I'm not leaving you alone. We made a promise. I would rather end up dead than leave you behind. You idiot! Every word he spoke, the young man's movements became easier for Mari to read. Almost as if he was exposing not only his deepest emotions, but also his greatest weaknesses. Now, with a wild, unfocused sea of bullets, she found an opportunity as though a path was opening up just for her. She leapt forward, the barrel from mech just a few meters away from her opponents, aiming directly at his windshield. Oh! act that caught even Mari by surprise. Shadow managed to steer her mech toward them with the last bits of her strength. One final act of desperation, Shadow tried to protect the life of the only person she had ever truly loved. In exchange for her own? <laughs> Ocean of flame enveloped the mech in a tight embrace in front of him. Her mech enveloped her, enveloped Shiloh. His sister, his beloved sister, was trapped in her mech. She was... No, 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 no! With trembling hands, he pulled himself out of the mech, stumbling over his own legs toward the metal suit, rather what was left of it. He had to get to her. He had to pull her out, he had to save her, but he couldn't. His legs simply wouldn't move. Move now. Move, move, move. I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to. Shiloh, I have to... Shiloh, Shiloh, Shai. His legs gave way and he fell to his knees, crushed by the weight of his emotions. He couldn't do anything. No matter how desperately he had tried, it seemed as though the flames had built an impregnable wall of heat around her mech, as though they were doing everything in their power to wash her away, away from him. Shiloh. <laughs> Uh. His anguished cry, filled with regrets and echo, echoed through the expansive hall, drowned in the roaring of flames. His tears burned deep into his flesh, mocking his plight, painfully reminding him of his failure. He so desperately wished to keep her safe protect her gentle, pure soul from the cruelties of this world. But now, little, little, little did he know, he long failed. She was gone, violently ripped from him. With her, his heart, which had only beat for her. What was the point of his meager existence without her? What reason was there to live for anymore? Starry sky passed above those to those who had managed to overcome this day and the tragedy it brought. New day awaited those strong enough to have survived. Those with the privilege of leading a new life on another arc, and a new home. But without their loved ones, could it really be called home? Love. No home. The futile attempt to provide him with a sense of comfort, his childhood friend had closed her hand around his. He couldn't feel her soft touch, nor her warmth. He felt nothing. 
Nothing but. She is gone. Yes. Shiloh is dead. Yes. Unbridled rage. She was irrefutably gone, consumed by flames before him, or an explosion caused by that woman. Mari, the deathbringer of the rebellion, monster would have sent thousands of lives to their doom in the blink of an eye. Ah, that's how it turned. No, yes. that's not. No, I don't like that. <laughs> when his breathing stopped, she shivered at his expression. He was smiling. A large grin twisted his face like he had been told a joke. He was enjoying all of this. <laughs> Blood is not okay. This manic laughter filled the vehicle. It was not that carefree, na naive laughter Yona had grown so fond of. It was one filled with hatred, disgust, and full of rage. That moment she saw it before her, that familiar darkness, but it also wrapped itself around Shiloh's heart and dragged her into the abyss, appeared. Nahum, you... I will kill her. I will take everything from this woman. Everything. The people she loves most. <laughs> I will burn them to ashes before her eyes. Even if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> oh, Shiloh. <laughs> oh, my lovely Shiloh. Who? <sighs> that went very bad. That went very badly, very quickly. Understandably. I feel like we still have a lot of questions we have not answered yet. Although we could probably reason out enough of it to get by. Like, what happened to Ira? Darius had to have known. Darius killed Rufus. Darius likely discovered Ira in the closet. Killed Ira. My thought process is that Darius telling Elias that, ooh? Once upon a time, in a not-too-distant past, there was a little boy, born to be the shame of the royal family. Side Darius? Born the son of royalty and a prostitute. He was confronted with the reality of the world at an early age, with discrimination, hatred, and greed that humans carry in their hearts. Each passing day, he had to fight for his survival, to withstand those who sought to end his life due to his impurity and the dishonor he bore. Oh, what a poor fate this boy had. But there was one woman, a beautiful, gentle woman with a heart made of gold. She was his oasis of peace, his greatest joy, his mother. Oh, Darius, come here. Did you get into another fight? Oh, come here, my baby. Let me tend to your wounds. What? You made this flower crown for me. Darius, are you sleeping? Darius, why are you sleeping out here? You're going to catch a cold. Yet the source of light in his life was snatched from him in an act of jealousy and resentment. Because of the attention of his sleazy father, his mother had been taken away from him in a fit of jealousy. Poisoned out of revenge, the murder of his mother was dismissed as a natural death, the consequence of an illness. But the young Darius knew the truth. 
His mother was murdered for simply being a dirty prostitute who had seduced the heart of a royal. That was all she'd been to these people. A dirty prostitute. No, she was so much more than that. She was a human being with a smile that was so warm and a soul so pure. Darius couldn't accept this disrespect, this injustice of categorizing people based on their background, their physical predispositions, watching their rights as humans being taken away from them. The royal family with their perverse ideals, feasting on the suffering of the vulnerable, shouldn't be allowed to exist any longer. Darius wanted to kill the royal family. Charlotte wanted to kill everybody. No matter what he had to do, no matter what sacrifice he has to make, he has to make a change. For the good of mankind. And then he met her. The day of reckoning had finally arrived. At last he would stop the suffering of the people once and for all. Banish the darkness and fear from people's hearts. This was to begin with him. But he went to the ignorance of the wealthy. A perfect example of how they spit on and trample the weak. It was his turn to die. The one who was responsible for the death of Darius' his mother killed her for the sake of his family's honor. His also beloved half-brother. Hey! Have you lost your mind? Seeing this pathetic man in front of him like this, his usually smug expression washed away. Placed by one as if he was a deer dazzled by the headlights. Oh, Darius had longed for this day, the moment where he would finally repay him for all the years of torment. Darius would finally see who was truly strong, the, one, the stronger one between them. Wait! <laughs> the closet he and Shiloh had planned to hide Rufus's body, and they found a young boy, the crown prince. His body was trembling violently. His eyes were wide open as he looked up at them. Darius's mind raced, unable to move. This boy had seen them, seen them kill Rufus. He had to die. He couldn't live, but... Darius couldn't kill a child. No, he just couldn't do it. He... Shiloh could. No! What? Shiloh, who he thought would never hurt a fly, who had given her heart to him, stepped past him and, having the boy by the hair, pulled him out of the closet so ruthlessly and threw him down to the floor. No! Please! Don't! I didn't see anything! I promise! No! Shut up what was happening before his eyes. Darius was frozen, unable to stop staring at how roughly she pressed her hands around the little boy's neck, how he tried to free himself, squirming, clawing at his ar at her arms. <laughs> oh, that's where the scratches came from! <laughs> Holy shit! And her smile brimming with amusement. Who was this woman? out of the meeting hall's window, his gaze was fixated on the plateau, or rather what it used to be. Now it was littered with corpses and himeras who roamed the moonlight streets singing their agonizing melodies. What have I done? Is this the world I wanted to create? Is this how I would bring freedom to mankind? My plans start to go awry. Was it when I had brought this woman into the arcs? and led her into my life? Was it much earlier? Racking his brains all over all the potential what-ifs wasn't going to get him anywhere at this point. What's done is done. It's irreversible. There is no way he could amend the past. Now, now whom shows up? One thing left for him to do was... Ah. Uh... Oh, hello. On the corridor, shadows emerged an elegant young woman with long, straight hair. Dark as the night sky. Wonderful gleam glistened in her vivid blue eyes. A handgun was tightly clutched in her hand. Why? What was the point in all of this? Was it utter destruction you wanted? To drag people to the depths because you were wronged? Yona, who we had normally regarded as a reserved young woman, was seething with emotions. There was so much anger and pity in her voice. She pitied him, but why? Why would anyone have such feelings for him, for someone who had caused so much harm? The deaths of so many weren't planned, and neither was the destruction of the Ark. To be honest, nothing went according to plan. I had placed troops all over the plateau, and sent Shiloh, an experienced soldier, into the slums so that 
the Hymeras could be wiped out as quickly as possible. They were only meant to be a distraction, to stir up some chaos and shift the blame to the rebels. The citizens weren't supposed to be the target, but... Calming himself, he took a deep breath and closed his eyes, letting his head hang low. Sir, I'm going to take your life now. For willingly risking the lives of so many innocent people to achieve your ideals. At the end of it all, are you really different than the rest of the royal family? Did you really act for the good of the people? It pained him so much to hear us say the truth. He wasn't any better than the people who had hurt him all these years. In the end, he'd only brought more suffering into the world and the lives he could have improved or saved through his actions. Thank you, Yoda. Whew! All right. Yep, that was the moment where Shiloh was firmly lost. God. That bastard man. Also. Gosh, that... Ooh. Beautiful artwork by Autumn, indeed. She loves Robin and is always tired. That's a mood. But ah, the soundtrack was really good. Wonderful tracks composed by composed by Chaz Hozak. Beautiful artwork by Autumn. The stark contrast between the, that dream at the beginning and this here nightmare. The, the very real point, implications being that that moment in that flashback. Here's our team. Oh, here's our team indeed. Evan, our creator, director. Auto editor, programmer, all across the board. It's a fantastic story. Not gonna lie. All of our staff, our staff, our, all of the team. Ooh. So you're responsible for the Hymeras? Honestly, really cool. Oops. It's also really cool that that has uh, external links if you want to check out more of their work here. Pick up the game. Give a click. And find their socials, their pages. Uh. There's a little dude. Team Pet! <laughs> Quality assurance all. That's wholesome, though. Clock programmer. The clock function. That was also cool. That was a cool touch. There is our... Uh, Friends here, and gosh, the voices were came out. Voices were really good. Honestly, I really enjoyed hearing this all the way through. Aaron, Esther, Mari, ah, uh, My understanding, yeah, we have blood-covered snow. We have a past story in this universe to, to, to uh, we can revisit here. And there's clearly more projects planned in this universe, which is very intriguing. Because, man, that came crashing down in a hurry. And really, let's check our notes. 
Oh, Hartfeld, welcome back. I think I read. I think I read the author's. Uh... Ooh, blood-covered snow is a future. Is a future look then? Curious. We had a great time reading our narrow Nano Reno 2024 project. So much time and energy went into its creation, and all team members worked hard to be able to present it to you now. What do you think of Shiloh and, and Nahum's story? What will happen to Nahum now that he's all alone? He's not going to be well. So we should play Blood-Covered Snow to learn more. Curious. Duly noted. Under the False Sky is a series. Put the story back in 2014 is cool. Project didn't let me go. I'm mean, getting a chokehold. Understandable. Gundam, Aldona Zero, 86, God Eater, such a huge inspiration, helped me make it what it is today. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know why the, the arc also gives me... The arc and the general, like, description of the mechs in general give, also gives me armor, Armored Core vibes for some reason. The future? Otome Jam 2024 is more under the false sky. I don't overwork yourself again, but with pride. Oh, take care, take care. Obviously looking forward to more, but... Yes. Need to leave a rating, comment, review on each page? Most certainly will. And in the end... Yeah, let's... I think what I'm most impressed about is... I think playing this through again... Like, hmm. I, you know, I said a bunch in the previous video, video, the first half of this game, that how uh, essentially with this full playthrough, we really started to get a clear picture of. Uh, how everyone's relationship dynamics fit together. Except for Shiloh's, like... There are a few people we see... the side of the dynamic fitting towards Shiloh, but we never really got Shiloh's true feelings in anything. And in hindsight, she really did... Maybe she did always... I mean, I think the implication at the end is that Shiloh really did, above all else, love Nahum. Since she... took a bullet for him. And died in his place. Nahum never, never knew the full story, so Mari and Rebellion were deemed as the ultimate cause of the slaughter that happened in the Ark. Which, maybe that means that blood, that this is, uh, hmm. curious, might have to try blood covered snow, see where the story goes. Since that, li that little tease that this will tell us a little bit about what Nahum gets up to after all this. But. I think impressively how it. We maybe have just those little hints of how the dynamic wasn't entirely one-sided in Darius's favor. We don't see what Shadow's true feelings are. We don't... There's... Like... Definitely don't want to be believe it. 
since it looks really bad. Darius is very clearly doing this to her. And yet, all those odd looks and odd masks that she comes back with. Hmm. Thinking back on how we got that, how we got to that point, and man, we st still we still don't really know, do we? What happened to the others? don't know what happened to them in the end. Ah. I suppose it's meant to leave off as that way. Just meant to leave off there. It's a, uh, It is a tale of an absolute tragedy. I will never actually forget that. We could absolute a tale of how an absolute tragedy came to came to pass. Brought on by a man who was trying to do a wrong uh, something a very very bad thing for ostensibly when he convinced himself was good reasons, and how that itself got thrown off by a factor he never could have possibly known about. She never knew that such a power source existed for it, the Ark, until she fell into it, no doubt. Is that the implication that we're that this happened three years ago? They were down deep in the ark, and she fell even deeper. Like that red tint links up with the red pillar, which is powering the core, the ark, right? And that's the point where something stabbed within her. That's the point where that darkness first gripped her heart. And everybody... in all their lack of maturity couldn't work them couldn't work things out amongst themselves so we're left with a bunch of uh, broken promises and broken hearts and forever bloodied hands as this world moves on to an uncertain future will we ever see any of these will we ever see any of these folks again stay tuned to the series and find out That very much delivered on the uh, ominous, concerning setup. And that got me good. It made, it made a ton of sense, ultimately. I suppose I still have that, I, I suppose I still have that question of how the core of the arc works, and was it that that prompted the, the big the biggest chain that was that was that that prompted that like got Shiloh off the edge or pushed Shiloh off the edge and forever pushed her down this path or was she always kind of on that edge the implication from the prologue is likely that she was always kind of on that edge she was always the one driving them forward to survive she was the first one to kill someone. 
to survive. But they were living on in the Ark, in the military. Which means that something pushed her back over that edge. And it's likely discovering the core. Did that affect her? Is the implication there that, uh... I might be piecing this together fully here. Big brain time. Implication there that the purges, where they throw people off the Ark, turn them into Himeras. Their souls. Power. The soul's power... The core, which keeps the rest of humans from turning into Hymeras. That's how my mind is sort of putting together this logical exchange, which... In the minds of the, the class structure of the art justifies this, uh... Willful... Disposal of human life. They get turned into Himeras, their souls used to power the core of the Ark. And perhaps that's a function that Shiloh knew about, and discovering the core of the Ark and seeing this. Which Mari, who saw it for the first time, immediately identified what was hovering around in his souls. So Shiloh likely could have drawn the same conclusion and pieced all that together and sent her down this dark path. I may be just spitballing here. If I, if I am spitballing way out of control, I really apologize, but I just... That's how, that's how things are fitting together in my head. And in the end... Ultimately, in the end tragedy across the board, right? No one was spared for the tragedy. Yona, Yona lost one and a half childhood friends. Shiloh died, and Nahum ostensibly died in that core, too. Yona lost Lydia, who was a good friend. Zeke lost Lydia. Who he was apparently very horny for. I don't know why that's. I don't know why that surprised me so far, so much. Getting into Zeke's head and finding out that he was just as he was just as chock full of hormones as everyone else. I don't know why that surprised me. Maybe my the preconceived notion of Zeke that I'd formed in my <laughs> played him off as more laid back, but he is indeed a he is indeed a boy full of hormones. Understandable, sir. Have a nice day. He's a competent one. I'll give him that. God, I do feel bad for Yona. I do really feel bad for Yona. There, seeing her friends crumble and collapse, being unable to do anything about it, or perhaps just straight up not doing enough about it. <laughs> Ultimately, Yeah, it's a tragedy across the board. Our good family... Good family man. Again, I think I said my piece about uh, Isaiah early, in, early on. Spottings of a good dad. But still with that royal privilege to the point where he... Uh, instinctively looks down on people, and that's still the problem. And... Hmm. I 
All right, I think, yeah, if we're gonna sign off, sign off, sign off, sign off in the end before I get go rambling on too, too much longer. If you don't like the videos for long enough, if you've been around my content for long enough now, I think it's a good, you would know that it's a good sign that uh, I've gotten into the, I've gotten into the story when I sit here rambling about it for a half hour afterwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes, I very much enjoyed this. If I want to, if I want to sit here for a half hour afterwards and recap it and piece it all together in my head. I really enjoyed it. It's stuck in my head now. Glad I went back and played this finally. We're here. It was worth it. I'm gonna stop now before I start try and start dissecting why this is subtitled Idealize. Put your thoughts in the comments section, and I will see you next time. Until then, until then.